All right. I'm going to take a picture of all of you, because I'm coming all the way from California, in case you can't tell from the accent. So it's sort of fun. Um, I hosted Veronica and, and, uh, and Eric and a few other folks for the uh, North American IPv6 uh, event. And uh, it's a great pleasure to come out here and present to you folks. My goal is actually for this to be interactive and not to be my presentation, because I'm actually interested in getting feedback from all of you, since you should have a clue about what the heck I'm talking about, as opposed to uh, maybe many of the other folks that I get a chance to speak to on a regular basis. And so with that, I just wanted to click through my slides and then hopefully start a little bit of controversy <laughs> and see if you agree or not. My goal around this uh, presentation is really to talk about how operations and network design back and forth and getting a tighter loop around that process, specifically for enterprise networks. Um, what needs to happen for folks that are in the enterprise, the challenges they face in terms of trying to get a tighter loop and feedback. And this part of it, I don't think we do particularly well. I think we do design and we have a whole team that does design and then we have a whole team that does operate. And then often the operators get down to a set of problems that they're trying to solve. And they never go back to the original design and say, should we have modified what we did in the first place and should we change what our behavior for our design is going forward? I think it's usually a case of the operator has to deal with the problems of the poor choices that I made as a network design architect, right? And they just have to live with them. And so what I'd like to do is have us think a little bit um, more prescriptive about how we do this cycle here. So with that, I wanted to talk about sort of the real design and, and ops problems that I see pretty commonly in the deployments that I do. It's some sort of supportable address plan, and I, I like to call this the, the Goldilocks syndrome. Um, it, it, it comes from V4. On the V4 side, right, it's too small, it's too big, we want to just write. Um, and, and there's a lot of battles that go back and forth around that. The IP address assignments, uh, we have a very binary view about how we do IP address assignments. Uh, today, especially in V4, right, you either do static assignments or you do DHCP. There's not a lot of room in between. Uh, the help desk and troubleshooting, so we leave the hardest problem for everyone else, which is all our help desk folks. We don't own them as network operators. We don't own them as, as certainly as architects. I don't get the phone call in the middle of the night that says these horrible things are going wrong. The help desk folks get all of that. <laughs> well, some of you do. <laughs> Luckily, I'm not in that particular side. On the enterprise side, I don't. Um, and then the IPv6 network team problem, which is that everyone thinks IPv6 is just a network team problem. How many folks actually hear this on a very regular basis? Oh, yeah, v6 is really interesting. That's your problem. I, I'm in the database team. I have nothing to do with v6. You guys, I, I don't even deal with anything. Network protocol isn't my thing. So it's, fa it's, it's what I call past the flaming bag of you know what uh, in terms of dealing with it. it's within an enterprise as opposed to really sort of breaking down silos and working together. So I want to talk about IP address assignment uh, first, which is the, sort of that binary view set. And I want to see how many folks have, have gone through this experience or not. Um, we're going to break this down very quickly. I have an example of sort of a data center IPv6 uh, address assignment on the left, an example campus IPv6 address assignment on the right. And this isn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But it's sort of a, an example of the quick things that you would go through, core network, uh, sort of boot services, you know, if you've got zero touch provision for a setup inside your data center, bare metal services, virtual machines. And this sort of just a breakdown of like DGP versus static and what you would do throughout that. And the same thing for, uh, for your campus side. So normally you're going to need some sort of TTP boot services, things of that nature. Is everyone sort of in agreement that this is a good general broad category for V4? Seems to cover most of it. Is there anything I'm really missing? Yes? Does anyone not use DHCP? Like everyone's still manually assigned? You have to use both? Fair enough. So let's take a look at what I consider sort of the functional breakdowns of v4, which has static and DHCP, and then IPv6, which has static, DHCP v6 stateful, DHCP v6 stateless, and Slack. And sort of the methods of like, I just grabbed a couple of, of examples in here to list off. Obviously, you can build the chart the full way down. But data center servers, normally most folks do this statically in some way. They may even do with DHCP, but with some sort of reservation, but effectively it's static. Same thing with uh, virtual machines. Uh, they're probably doing something, maybe static, but probably DHCP because it's being assigned out of the, out of the, actual, um, uh, out of the actual hypervisor, right? It's setting up addresses for you. Same thing for, yes? Oh, yeah. Uh, come on, turn the mic on. We have a mic. Uh, okay. There we go. Um, 
Uh, don't forget the, the fifth column on there, the pain in the ass privacy addressing. <laughs> yeah, I left that off intentionally. <laughs> yeah, but there's, there's a couple other things that are missing off this, this line set. Uh, you, could, you could argue that ULA should be on there too. Um, for right now, I'm covering sort of the broad spectrum of really uh, the address assignment side and not really dealing with either privacy or uh, the link local addressing components. Hopefully that's fair. Um, I, what I'm trying to show is, is actually here, uh, or at least to highlight out, what I consider some of the oddball change differences you notice behavior-wise from an operator standpoint uh, between v4 and v6. So you'll notice on like the virtual machine side, you're gonna see a maybe and a yes, a maybe, yes, maybe, maybe, right? In terms of that configuration up here. And so what I'm trying to do is get, is get some consensus of like where things may match between v4 and v6 from an operator principle that you should take into consideration in your design. So a good example is the guest Wi-Fi. You're probably not gonna ever set up anything static in your guest Wi-Fi. It's, everything's gonna be DHCP. And then we get to the disaster that we deal with in Wi-Fi today about whether you have Android devices on your Wi-Fi net, whether you're gonna support RFC 6106, or whether you're gonna deal with, I wanna do DHCP, I'm gonna leave the, uh, all the Android devices on, on V4, right, on my wireless net. What situation do I wanna deal with? How do I get DNS propagation information? Do I require dual stack? Do I require single stack V4 or V6? Right? There's a lot of ambiguity. From an operator principle standpoint, the stuff for V6 is a lot harder than it was for me to deal with in V4. But from a design standpoint, it actually looks identical. Does that make sense? Does that statement actually make sense? Bueller? Is that a wrong movie? Does that even <laughs> translate? I, so I, honestly, I mean, as a design, as someone who's doing design, right, the first thing I want to do in, in a wireless net, guess wireless net, is just have everyone pre-provision their address. Uh, I'm gonna do security checks in a different way. I'm not gonna use addresses to do security checks, right? From a security standpoint, policy standpoint, it doesn't make any sense. And that's how I want it to operate in V4. And that's how I want it to operate in V6. But in V6, I got three options about how to, deal, how to build that. Does that make sense from an operator standpoint? That's like messed up, right? I'd say the F word, but I don't wanna, you know. Is that, is that reasonable? Because uh, what I'm trying to do is get to operator principle. Like, how do we want to explain this to enterprises? What's the best way to choose? Which one of those do you choose? Which one do you pick? Has anyone actually picked? Oh, Facebook has picked. What did you guys pick? <laughs> Claim ignorance. No comp. <laughs> no comp. We picked all of them at Microsoft. Picked all of them at Microsoft. There you go. So, so we just made the help desk team's job like three times harder, right, to figure out what the heck is going on here because we don't have a good design or operator principle about what we should do, okay? This is our fault, by the way. As, 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 a, as a group of individuals sitting in the room that are supposed to have some sort of influence in V6, this is our fault, shame on us, right? Because we messed this up. This is why V4 is so much freaking easier to do. Anyone disagree? Wow, not a single person, someone take a video of this right now. <laughs> not a single person disagreed on that one. All right, so let's jump to the OS support side because this gets even more fun because I'm an OS guy. Right? I spend the majority of my time on, on OS related problems. So let's talk about the crazy state of all the different operating systems and what we deal with here. And, and the things, the red flag should be the section in the middle right here that has double overlays of like problems, right? Of DHCP v6 stateful and stateless along with the core set of OSs. Actually, Apple does a fantastic job, you know, uh, with theirs. Uh, Windows just recently added, and this was the part about the, the comment, there was a, some feedback about, should I say RFC 6106 or 8106? And I have not been able to find a single set of documentation, including from Marcus on his blog post on, on APNIC. Um, you know, has uh, Chris did a blog post there on, on, on RFC uh, 8106 support in, in Windows and the creator's update. I've not been able to find any documentation that is actually 8106 that's supported. It's actually 6106 that's supported. Yes, right, and there's no plan See. So, um, so 8106, is there a single operating system that supports 8106 that anyone is aware of today? Does people know the difference between 8106 and 6106? Everyone know what 6106 is. Our DNSS, it's being able to get DNS information from, from your RA so that your host can actually bring up you can do like a V6 only network and actually be able to get out and do something because you actually have DNS server. So that, that part of it has a whole set of challenges that go, goes along with it too. 
And, and before we were really broken, right, because Windows and Android and, you know, well, we can, we can talk about Lorenzo all day long, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that one alone. It's, it's going to be what it's going to be. But I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm excited that 6106 support is in the creator's update, but it's going to take us years to get to the point where 6106 can be the standard as opposed to doing something with DHCP v6 stateful. Just my opinion. It's going to be years. Go ahead. This is all interactive. Um, yeah, you, you wanted to know what, what we're doing. I said we do SLAAC. Um, I mean, that's mainly you know, things like our office network. Um, uh, there's a whole other can of worms when you start looking at L2TP and LNS and DHCP v6 and prefix mm -hmm. delegation and all of that. Yeah. And then things like um, uh, Hyperoptic, we're talking about DHCP v6 on sort of an Ethernet level rather than on a PPP level. So there's, there's, there's a lot more can of worms than you're just explaining here. It's, yeah, it's I, I would agree with you. Yeah. I'm trying to keep it simple. Well, <laughs> um, the other thing is what we've tried to do is, um, I mentioned privacy addressing earlier. On, on our office LAN, we'd quite like to be able to see from logs on systems what IP addresses, what devices have done what. Um, by SLAAC, we could match it to a, match it to a MAC address, but with all this privacy addressing, all we see is these random addresses everywhere. So we tried using DHCP v6 to force a device to use a fixed address. And can I get my iPhone to do that? No. <laughs> if anyone yeah. succeeds in doing that, I'd love to know, because yeah. on our office, we'd like to fix that. Um, we'd, like, we'd like to have devices on known addresses. Right. That, that's part of the challenge, especially for enterprises, is, is getting the, the correlation information back and forth. There's some products that are doing some interesting things to try and scrape um, uh, scrape out of the tables on the router side to be able to stitch that information together. And there's there's some solutions that are that are possible. Uh, it's definitely not what I consider enterprise grade today. And I mean, I imagine you guys have faced a similar challenge in terms of trying to pull information out of your core routers uh, to stitch together uh, alerting information. Most of that's done. Most of that's done because of the authentication information provided. When right. So the comment was most of that's done on auth for like 802.1x for auth components, right? It makes it way yeah. Easier. Makes it much easier. I would agree with that. Anyway, I'm I, I just trying to demonstrate here some of the challenges you're going to deal with as you try and do enterprise-wide deployment about the common operating systems you see today. I'm not aware of anyone supporting 8106 um, uh, out of the gate uh, right now. I would challenge anyone to, who, uh, to sort of show me a deployment that has that. But uh, 6106, I'm, I'm pretty thrilled with. So uh, I wanted to cover a quick customer use case. I've, I've done these several times for some bigger customers. Um, what I want to talk about was the sort of, sort of uh, the supportable address plan side. This is the, the thing I go round and round with on the network design side versus the operate side. The operators have a, 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 a firm set of requirement conditions about what they need to, to build and support within their, their environment. And the network design people are trying to design for, um, uh, I, I wouldn't say theoreticals, but probably abstractions that are different than what the operators are trying to solve for. And there's a big disconnect, actually, I see on a pretty regular basis between the two. And I'd like to hear some feedback about what you guys see amongst yourselves or even uh, in your own designs. And, and the reason for this is because uh, I see more projects stall because people can't settle about what they want to do here as opposed to just getting on with it. Um, yes? Close the gap. There's no architects? There's no that is one way to fix it. There's no designers, there's no architects, there are engineers, right? Yep. Networks and fix what is broken. That's awesome. So people that build the network are responsible for operating it, right? Yep. So you build something, you support it, otherwise you don't do it. Yeah, I, I would say this is a classic problem of enterprise network pro problems. Want me to repeat it? So at Facebook, they solve this problem by, uh, of the disconnect between the two by basically eliminating the whole idea that there's an architect. You're an engineer, you operate a network, and that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> that's your job. <laughs> so back to the, you get to wear the pager, you get to own it. You did a bad design, you get to operate it too, <laughs> which is a good way to go, philosophy-wise. It sounds really nice, but you can't get away from the fact that uh, uh, a lot of the equipment you have, the bring your own device, those places have architects, and some of them are actively trying to shaft you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, won't, I won't name names, but I think we can all think of one, who are sticking to a principle that it's most important that you have to be able to tether on your phone and then run over a corporate network <coughs> against its policies. Uh, so it pretty much says, 
we want it this way, you globally have to move to our model because we're not going to support one that works for you. Yeah. So would, the, the uh, architects exist, they just don't work for you. Yes, I, 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 uh, in principle I would agree with that. I find it very difficult and frustrating as someone who tries to help customers operate networks on a regular basis that, uh, that yes, uh, you would have that situation go on. Uh, it's a little hard when that gentleman just reports directly to the founder of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it a little rough to have those conversations when he has that sort of direct support. But I, I, I'll leave it. Th I'll leave it at that. We can, we can share drinks over that one later. Um, so what I wanted to do was sort of share what I consider same same sort of use case scenario setups of, of v4 address planning with RFC 1918, and uh, just some simple global unicast address space. Uh, um, uh, and and the way I've consistently seen people sit down and do this is like. Oh, well, you know, I've got a, a slash 16 of 10 address space that I'm going to utilize for my network meets my need requirements. Um, I've got uh, X number of, uh, of bits to deal with. I've got eight bits to deal with in, in, in terms of that. So I'm going to uh, replicate the exact same thing in my, v, in my v, uh, V6 scenario set. Um, and one of the reasons I think this is really broken or, or, or done differently uh, is because in my mindset, I only deal with, in V6 anyway, I only deal with how many networks I want, want to operate. I don't care how many hosts you have at all. It's just not relevant in the discussion. Uh, does everyone agree with that comment? Or you think I'm crazy? So 2 to the 64th minus 2, 2 to the 64th minus 10,000. It's the same freaking number, right? <laughs> it's the same number, so we just don't care about hosts anymore. Can we, we're all cool with that? So that's, that's my assumptions. It, you know, uh, the reality is, is that when you start breaking down the math and looking at this uh, from an operator principle basis, uh, I actually really like what Aaron's doing. Uh, hopefully you don't say that. He's coming over here and saying, saying I like what Aaron's doing in terms of address allocation policy. But um, the reality is, in terms of what they provide with a 48 for site and how they do some automatic roll-ups for pre-allocations pre for, for small and medium-sized businesses and how many networks they need to operate, they have some really good rules of the road. Uh, and I think, um, I think there's uh, something to be learned from what they're providing there. My biggest challenge is sitting down with customers who have a V4 mindset trying to do a V6 design. And so this is that operate to, to architect closing the sort of design and, and operator principle. And, and what I find interesting about this is out of the design side, maybe this is the better question is, is it a good assumption that you should be safe using the same sort of number of bits Right? I don't think so. I think it's a crappy assumption. But it seems to be the assumption that every network operator team that I deal with goes and makes this assumption automatically. Number of, network op the number of networks that I operate in my V4 network today should be the same number of networks that I operate in V6. Now, I get it from an operator standpoint of some practicalities of I need the same number of networks, but should I limit or constrain myself based off of that rational or decision making process? And I, I don't think so. And I, this is. This is the thing that I'd like to hear some, some direct feedback from people. But I, I found that it's been very hard to get teams to look at it and say, like, how do I get my networks to be much larger and not worry about segmenting out how many host address configurations versus v4, network subnets that I need to operate, and how many networks do I have internally? Maybe I can't add that many, that many VLANs. And I go, well, you know, that's what VXLAN was invented for, so we don't have to deal with this problem anymore, right? From an overlay perspective, you don't have to just that, that issue is gone. You're not worried about how many, how many VLANs from a bit perspective you have to deal with. People agree with that, or am I, am I completely crazy? I know I'm already, my wife already says I'm crazy, so let's leave that one alone. Is it different if you come to it as a greenfield V6 as opposed to having all the baggage of your existing V4? Yeah, I don't know of a single person who gets greenfield, except for, except for this team over here maybe, uh, that gets a greenfield V6 data center. Who gets greenfield V6? How many folks got a greenfield V6? Yeah? <laughs> Yeah, OK. One out of the entire room. Two? Some of them, right? But there's always one Yeah, you're always going to be running some sort, of, some sort of thing dual stack. And this, this is where my conflict is of, of dealing with them on the operator side. So any brilliant ideas in the room? I'm coming to you guys. You didn't know this. I was coming to you guys for ideas. That was the goal of this. It wasn't for me to solve any problems for you guys. It was for me to get ideas. What, what's the thought process around this one? Anything? How do, you, how do you get escape velocity out of the V4 mentality of thinking? You just go drink at the bar? That's what I do. Because I just cry a lot. <laughs> Come on. Anything? Are you asking from an enterprise perspective? Or? I'm asking from an enterprise perspective. I, th I, th I think, so look, we all know that home and you guys on the service provider side have done a fantastic job. What's 
the bastion of like holdouts that were all like sitting in the corner and like never wanting to leave V4. You have to convince your executives that it's, V4 is a risk. So convincing the executives that V4 is a risk. Um, and then you scorecard the violators. Scorecard. Grind them out of existence. Grind. <laughs> well, I wish I had that sort of influence. Trite, but that's effectively what you end up doing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's. I think it's. I think it's hard because I think it's hard for a lot of the network operator folks to actually reach escape velocity in their own mind about what they actually need to build next generation for their for their own companies. So this is just an example of talking through like your size allocations, right? For many medium-sized organizations, that may hold true. For the V6 side, I don't know if a 40 is big enough for most most shops. I run a test. I run a test network. I work for a really small company. We got 150 employees. We do 300 million in revenue. We're a pretty small shop. I, I've got a 36. Huh? That's not small. It. Well, what's interesting? So here, let me give you an argument. So I was just I was just re recently over meeting with the the team at Nvidia, talking about how to build networks for allocations for V6. And the interesting thing in discussing with them is they don't consider their lab networks, every single implementation of the lab networks that they need to build. But by the way, if you look at a DGX, everyone familiar with the NVIDIA's hardware platforms? DGX, their DGX is their server platform, eight cores inside of it, runs containers. It's for their implementation of doing you know, CUDA or if you want to do you know, TensorFlow or anything else for analysis on, on, on their side for, for, for doing a sort of large scale uh, compute models uh, around machine learning and AI. And what's really interesting is they'll build a large scale lab configuration. And if you think about how container networks are built, right, from a size and scoping perspective, they need to hand out a tremendous number of addresses for, to spin all those resources up on those local boxes. So getting them to just free up and say like, well, guess what? You may want to build one test over and over and over again incrementally. How do you assign enough network space to be able to do that? Right? And I actually think the interesting part about DHCP v6 PD that you mentioned earlier, I actually think that's going to start happening in the enterprise. If people look at me like I'm whack crazy. But it, the reason you're going to need start, start seeing needs for PD is because as you start spinning up containerized resources on a regular basis with Kubernetes and you just want to be able to self-assign networks and then be able to inject them back in on your core, that's really only the practical way of, of doing it. Has, any, has anyone actually like deployed large scale like Kubernetes deployments, clusters, configurations? Because that's it's it's really realistically. I mean, you can assign out a slash sixty four and just hand it hand out out of the slash slash sixty four. But we didn't deploy large scale, but that's exactly Yeah, it's the only way to do it. Does does everyone understand what the challenge is with doing large scale container networking on on like local hosts and like how many addresses you'll chew up? So I did the basic math for you. Uh, like, if you do 10 million containers a second, how many people spin 10 million containers a second? Facebook might spin 10 million containers a second. Um, and, and then you take your standard you know, slash 64 allocation. Uh, how long would it take you to burn through your 48 that you allocated for your data center? Anyone want to do the fast math? How long would it take you? About 58,000 years. How many people think their data center is going to exist in 1,000 years? 1,000 <laughs> years, how many people? 100 years. You think your data center is still going to be here in 100 years? So don't worry about the number of addresses that you're signing out. But I think PD becomes like the freedom of like how do we assign as many networks as required for, for these next generation application services. You can see how important stitching this stuff together is. So I, I would argue the same thing can be true in the financial transaction world, that every single transaction that we do could be a single address and we just discard it afterwards. Never you use it again, ever. It's unique one time in its life cycle. So is, that, is that a whack crazy idea? I think that'd be interesting for banks. I mean, they're going to solve it with, 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 right, with blockchain, but, but it's just sort of an interesting idea. But you also know that some of the content um, creators, like Comcast or providers, they basically assign addresses per chunk of content. Right? Yep. And that's basically how they route you to get to it. That's yeah. what they are working on. So you can have something unique for the lifespan of that content yeah. anywhere in the world. It wouldn't that's matter, yeah. which, is, which is an interesting play, too. It's not really enterprise focus. It's more service provider focus. So jumping back to the help desk and networking, uh, for those of you that actually have to do this horrible job and, uh, and the, sort of the networking problem, um, what is it that we do uh, in design and operate that we hate these people so much? <laughs> it's 
Seriously, I mean, like, you know, if, if you ever stood up a dual stack network and then asked po some poor person to troubleshoot what the heck is going on about why something doesn't work. So the number one reason, I've had four customers now who have shut off V6 in their network because the first set of help desk queues that came through, they couldn't figure out what the heck was going on and they said, the, it must be something, we just turned this V6 thing on, okay, we just turned it on. It must be a problem with V6, it, by the way, it wasn't in all four cases. It must be something wrong with V6, they shut it off and they never went back to visit this problem again. Shame on us as operators and designers that that would be the problem, that these poor people have no freaking clue about what the heck to do. That's on us, right? As a V6 community that we don't educate, we don't train, we don't teach, we don't provide tools. What the heck is wrong with us? We just think it's funny, we're gonna turn it on and like hope it's all good? Work for us? Right? Did it work for everyone else? I mean, I don't mean to be negative. I do, sort of. But w what can we do as a, as a group that's going to make this a better experience for all of us? Pardon? If you're on call. If you're on call, it definitely helps. Yeah. But that, that puts us in the category of the help desk and troubleshooter, right? And I don't know if at many large scale enterprises that are offering 24 by 7 worldwide, if that's the right answer. But us as an industry, we've done an incredibly poor job of educating, providing tools, providing insight, right? In some ways, you know, happy eyeballs was a blessing and a curse. Made it super easy to fail back, back and forth, things flop back and forth. Try and make it predictable. Try and make your app predictable today from an app developer standpoint when it's flopping back and forth between two protocols. Doing DNS lookups between two protocols. Then you have like web server, ser server side return versus client side return and trying to figure out what the heck is happening and maybe third party content that may or may not be v6 enabled that may be going over some horrible carry grade network, right? How do you solve all these problems and how do you figure out where the problem actually resides? And I know Andrew and Dan have mixed feelings <laughs> about that, but you know, RFC 6555 definitely helped on the initial stage of adoption. I don't know if it's gonna help us on the second stage, right? with the browsers having it embedded. You know, Windows does it differently than, than how Linux does it versus OS X, which is different than iOS, which is different than Android, which is different than Chrome. Anyone want to build the matrix for this one? When you sit down and do support. So what's your poor help desk person supposed to do? I'm not sure either. I, I get this question a lot. I'd like to have a good answer. A shame on us, I did a crappy job helping advocate for V6 all these years and didn't solve this problem for you, right? This is the stuff that I, I scratch and I wonder about in terms of how we're gonna solve this as a group. Is that fair? Does anyone have a solution for me? I really like one. <laughs> V6 only? V6 only? Exactly, yeah. I would say that's actually a semi-reasonable answer. <laughs> that's awesome. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I just, you know, for me, this has been the struggle, the ongoing struggle is I've been trying to help enterprises implement and w for what's going on. Uh, whilst, I, whilst I sympathize with the... Uh, Can we get a mic? Yeah. <laughs> with the uh, intent of we should uh, do a better job for help desk support and stuff like that. Sure. The big challenge is, actually, they're no good at V4 either. <laughs> I, I, I know this is a horrible generalisation. I'm playing cynical Grinch today, uh, unlike normal. Uh, but the key there is that a lot of the time, in a lot of companies, the board, the CEO, answer to the shareholders, and they think those help desk guys should be cheap rather than good. So, of course, oh, tooling will make it better. But who builds the tooling? The, another set of cheap folk. And it, whilst I think we do have uh, a part in architecture, design, etc., on trying to help us get there, we can't do it alone. We've got to get the business behind us all the way through. And you know, otherwise, we just end up with a, one version of a race to the bottom anyway. Yeah. So I would agree that leads into the, the final thing, which is the network team problem. Um, I, I don't know how to sort of get this one out of the bubble except for to get executive buy-in to understand where V6 fits within the business strategy side of what an organization is doing. Um, 
I have seen some really interesting things. I will share one quick anecdote. How am I doing on time? It's fine. Okay. So quick anecdote. Uh, one interesting use case for one of my customers. Um, V6 actually is a great, uh, a great, very practical thing when you're dealing with mergers and acquisitions. How many folks have dealt with the overlapping RFC 1918 space mm -hmm. over and over and over again? And so what's really awesome about V6 is that you can go in and do a great sort of greenfield V6 design. This also allows you to take into account that you're going to build more networks than you're going to necessarily operate in V4 and be able to actually merge a company in from an acquisition, not touch any of its V4 address space, and then be able to use net new, your V6 address space, allocated out to them. And basically, you're able to then control who's touching your internal corporate net, because they're part of your address assignment. It's very easy to define what's happening there. You can build V6-only data center services, and you can then provide those services or allow that acquire company to import or move their services into your V6-only data center. You can literally shut off and provide V6 only services to them, let them continue to operate their V4 the way they were prior, they simply just can't touch any of your resources with a V4 address. Has anyone actually used this? I've done one implementation of this so far. It's been pretty interesting. Has anyone else had a chance to actually do this or tested it or thought about it? In some respects, we have an internal cluster of virtual machines. That's okay. Has anyone used it for the plan for around mergers and acquisitions, specifically around acquiring data? Yeah, yeah I, th I think it's an interesting thing to think about. So as you're talking to, hopefully, customers or you're thinking about what you're providing for your own network, if you're looking for that use case around V6 that is unique, that solves a real-world problem of you know, readdressing. So I happen to know the, the gentleman who did the V6 work at Oracle. Oracle took one set of customers and readdressed them three different times. Seagate did the exact same thing when they were going through theirs. They took someone and said, oh, we acquired you. Here's your RFC 1918 space that we're going to allocate out to you. And we just acquired another company over here that happens to be from the allocation that I just gave you. So I'm going to readjust you yet again. It's like just repeat over and over again. You just get to, you spend your entire life as a network engineer just doing readdressing plans. I don't see how that's productive for anyone. And this is that operate, close the operate to, to, to design side. And I actually think by doing a good V6 design for a merger and acquisition, you can actually solve this problem and not introduce operational headache while solving this with a good network design. Is that fair as an argument? So we have a comment to that. Sure. Because at Microsoft, we, we wanted that our, like, one of the latest acquisitions on LinkedIn, and we had the problem that our own internal resources were not V6 enabled. So how do you do that, right? They are V6 ready. We could have had that solution. But unfortunately, we are not there yet, right? The whole organization is massive, so right. yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's not going to be it's, perfect for everyone. I, I, I definitely agree. But it is something that if it's not on your roadmap as a strategy, yeah. Yeah. then you're missing out on some of the opportunity that V6 presents. And what I'm trying to do is give you little sets of, of maybe differentials around V6, because everyone always asks, like, why V6? I just introduced V6, I get the exact same features, and it costs twice as much, right, sort of argument. Because I, I burnt all my team's time running around doing all those sort of things, did network upgrades and a bunch of other things, and I, I got a networking protocol that does the exact same thing that I did with V4. Well, this is something unique that you can actually talk about in terms of differentiation of, of solving some structural problems. All right. Um, outside of that, I wanted to open it up for, for some general Q&A um, and, and see where people's heads were at around other operational to network design related problems they, they think they might be facing or, or are scratching their head about, I'd like, to, I'd like to hear because I have my viewpoints shared from doing this a bunch of times with customers, but I'd be interested to hear if, if anyone has anything different. Oh, come on, you guys. Someone has to have something different <laughs> than what, I, what I've outlined. There has to be some other use cases. Service provider side, is there anything different about what you guys are Designing. Is anyone actually doing Map T or Map E yet? How about that? I'll change the subject on you. I think quite a few uh, providers like it. But, uh, how to get from A to B, get CPE support, get it through the validation chain and logistics and all the rest means that it's actually quite a big piece of work. And you've got millions of things out there that still aren't upgradable to it. So it's a much harder sell than we'd like it to be right. for Map E and Map T. Uh, on the broader thing about you know, addressing and stuff like that, I think the SPs have it easy, right? 
we'll give you a 29 without any justification. You can be wasteful, you can be profligate, and you can rip it up and start again if you get it wrong. So yeah. just wasteful and sparse is the best approach. I would agree. <laughs> I'm just going to echo that, Ed. Uh, we've done a load of these as well. And every time we have to go through the same reprogramming exercise with our customers to change their views from the view that they've had for so long of conservation to one of basically wastefulness. And, and one of the things we have to do, which is an extra step, is that we find a lot of our customers come to us with their initial thoughts about our dress plan. And they say, well, we've read the principles in the RM policy, or we've read the principles in the right policy. And that includes conservation. And I say to all of them, I say, look, guys, you're not interested in what's good for the community or for RN or for right. What you're interested in is what is good for your future. And that's actually, for V6, it's the opposite of conservation. It's exactly what Ian said. You need to be wasteful. And so uh, we always advocate um, expecting the future to include the worst possible case you can think of and then multiplying it by many orders of magnitude. So, for example, every host gets a slash 64. Um, we always uh, um, say at least start there, um, but uh, yeah, so I just wanted to add to the fact that's exactly well, and, and, what and, we have to go through and every I've, time. I, I've started this with this conversation, I made the horrible mistake of starting this conversation with many customers of, of going more things along the lines of, um, uh, in, in terms of the, the wasteful side, of saying like, uh, can, your, can your business group give me your 30 year plan? This is my ignorance. 30-year plan, I'm like, I'm lucky if I get a five-year business plan out of most of the companies I deal with. Even Fortune, even, even, even Fortune 100 shops, most of them, if they can produce a five-year business plan for me, it's like a minor miracle about where they're going. Um, and so talking about a 30 or a 50 or a 100-year plan, it's just not relatable for the business people. They laugh at you in the room. So how do you deal with that? So just a bit of advice, don't start there. <laughs> First way, first, it's the first, their first instinct is the person doesn't know what they're talking about because they don't understand what we do as a business. They're not relatable to us in terms of what we do for a business. You, you don't have to plan or think about it that way. I think there's a different conversation that could be had there, but just, just be aware. Yeah, just to add again as well, Ed, we've had the experience, you probably had this too, where a number of our customers have already got V6 allocations, but it turns out not to be big enough. Yes. And they don't believe they can justify bigger and we've had to help them justify bigger. And we had one example um, where the MOD didn't have a big enough allocation and they said, well, RIPE's policy says we can't have the size that we need. So I said, well, you remember, change the policy, which is they did. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating. I've, I've, I've had really, really large <laughs> Fortune 50 companies and, uh, and, and I had that exact same conversation that my small little shop has a slash 36 and they were trying to design inside of a you know, slash 40. And I'm like, you gotta, you gotta change what you're, what you, how you're thinking about how you build and design networks to make sure that, that things are the appropriate size and that you're not using your V4 thinking and you're thinking about your growth and you're thinking about what you potentially would have to do. Um, you, you're not gonna get a lot of arguments that I've seen from most of the major um, registrars around that. Unless, unless you feel differently, Eric. Do you feel differently? No? You're sidelining? I caught you. <laughs> yes? Well, as a, a concrete example of that sort of thing is uh, in prior job, uh, slash 29 available, quite small compared to some of the other large uh, networks allocations out there. Right. But however, that's enough for 16 million customer slash 56s plus some spare 32s for right. uh, mapping plus infrastructure or whatever. And if you still need to decide, right, we're going 48s for everyone, that's exactly the justification that you can go and get a slash 23 or whatever right. from right and do it. And the same can apply to enterprises. And it's better to actually go and say, I want a large PIR allocation, or become an LIR, uh, rather than going and just asking for the default, because it saves you time later. Yes, I would agree. Although and the good RIRs sparse allocate anyway, you can grow to a degree. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. 
Um, I, I will say that one thing that has changed for me pretty significantly over the last year and a half has been the introduction of containers, both Docker and Kubernetes, changing how I talk about address allocations and thinking about their design. Um, I, would, I would advise you to change your thinking about what you need to actually allocate per host uh, and potentially at your top of rack configurations as you sort of progress through because it's, it, you can, uh, the introduction of container technology really radically changes how we want to think about address allocations. Hello, I've been slowly simmering over here uh -oh. and I feel it's, it's built up enough pressure now. Yeah. Um, and my thoughts don't reflect the thoughts of my company, but dual stack is an abomination. Dual stack's an abomination? It is, yeah. Why are we not yeah. thinking more about IPv6 only? There's a visionary up there, Pete, who runs his IPv6 data center. He's got some war stories, but, you know, it, IPv6 is that, that clean break, and we need to start as a community thinking about whether IPv4 is a second class citizen. Because if we don't have that discussion, you know, we just keep running and running and running with two protocols fighting it out for, for some form of, of importance. And at some point, we have to make a, a kind of a decision on which, which is going to meet the needs. Yeah. And, and, I... and we've. You know, what I've looked at in the past, we've got IMS on IPv6 only, and we, we faced some opposition on that. You know, a, a crucial new service for voice in our company, and a lot of it was, was just fear of being a victim. And if you get, a, get beyond that and actually say, well, well, let's drive it, let's make it happen, let's, let's force the vendors to, to, to play ball here, you can get on top of it. And, and we did that. And, you know, I, I think we need to, to, to try and do that a bit more because I don't see this, this, this diatribe about dual stack. It's, you know, the way we, we, we even just look at the stats across the world and, and talk about just enabling IPv6 as though that's job done. It isn't. That's yeah, not it's the turning off v4, right? It's turning off v4. Right. It's not running two protocols, not two address families. <laughs> that is a mess. Um, I, I, anyway, I would, that's my personal view. I've had a little bit uh, of rant. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, so uh, I agree with you from a long-term strategy perspective. Uh, uh, absolutely, from a task force perspective, I think that's, that's, uh, that might be difficult. Well, I think Zach might say a few words, and then I might say a few words. We are from the same organization. Go ahead, Zach. I was just going to double down on my earlier comment, which is, I agree, it's not IPv6 deployment. It's IPv4 decommissioning which is why you scorecard it, because it looks like every other technology decommissioning project that you would right. run in any enterprise. If you approach it from that perspective, it's not as exciting, but it's pretty effective. Right, I, I, I would 100% agree with both of you. I think the enterprise, having that conversation today for many of, the, many of the enterprise shops, which don't even have any thought or glimmer of getting V6 enabled, Dual stack is their safety net of, of being able to talk about they can continue to operate the way they're operating and introduce something without too much pain. Uh, and I found very consistently very few are open to sort of the V6 only first set of discussions, uh, except for some of the more creative shops that I deal with in Silicon Valley uh, are, are a little bit more willing to push the envelope in, in that particular arena. But I found for the wide swath in the United States in the middle, what I call the middle of the United States, uh, Pretty unlikely that the majority of them are going to are going to take that into consideration. Although I, I certainly agree with you that it's the way going forward that we need to think about it. Uh, our, our operator lives are going to be much easier if we're if we're on a single protocol. Um, so Ed, yeah. I would add to that even if you think about like business case justification uh, for doing V6 enabling. So yeah, absolutely dual stack, 100% agree. We see it. It's operational point, uh, pain. And it's just an intermediate step, like the toe in the water where you kind of get used to the protocol and the changes, and then you get on that path of switching V4. That's what we are doing in Microsoft in the CorpNet. We are working in that direction. But I would say one of the drivers for V6 is that it's happening around you anyway, right? The V4 as a service, that's already a reality in charter communication network in free in France. So basically, you don't know how the V4 is going to be treated as that second class citizen in the network. And it can impact the services that you provide to your employees. 
Think of your VPN. If your VPN head ends, concentrators are not V6 enabled, you don't do the both V4 and V6. It basically means, yeah, it can, the traffic can maybe still get through the map, map T, map E network, maybe. And if it does, then it could be actually suboptimally routed if you look at how the yeah. map TE's deployments are done in large networks. So you and your services will be impacted without you even like thinking about it. So that's your business case. That's the first one. That is happening anyway. The second one, industry is pushing you. Apple, App Store from iOS 10, all the apps that you've got there have to work behind NAT64 in IPv6 only. I count them regularly every three months. In Microsoft, we've got 87 apps in App Store. How do your developers test that? Do they just go have a Mac, you know, and they enable NAT64 and that's how they run it and then they hope that they have done a good enough job? We have to set up test environments for our product groups to make sure that all the functions inside the apps don't fail. Because in Apple, if they tell you, oh, your apps has failed, it's removed from the App Store, they don't give you detailed analysis. It's your job to go and figure out what went wrong. And we work with uh, large operators like T-Mobile US, who also SE, they, they are doing V6 only for their customers. And they had multiple complaints from people that are actually, for us, business impacting for our product groups because people stop using those products. And then we figure out it's not problem of the T-Mobile network, it's problem of our developers that they use wrong APS or old PS or whatever do, but we had to give them an environment in which they can actually prove it and find the root cause. So think about it that way. Do you really do business on the internet? If you do, you need to be able to support such an environment and offer it. There's All a right. question, Anna. Uh, sorry for spoiling the party, Veronica, here. Yeah. Um, on the V6 only, I, I consult in, in many very large organizations from traditional <coughs> space like manufacturing, automotive, chemical, and for none of those V6 only is, uh, is on the horizon, is an option uh, due to the large number of dependencies, uh, legacy stuff, legacy uh, components, and this will not go away, uh, not in two years, not in three years, not in five years. And as a very simple example, um, at the ITF 100, uh, two or three weeks ago, <coughs> There was a talk from Cisco on uh, like how we did V6 only. It turned out that they only did it in one building. And when you go through the slides, and we're talking about Cisco here, we're not talking about uh, like, um, again, chemicals, automotive. And when you go to the, through the slides, which are available, uh, there is one slide in the, in the, in the say, um, the last part of the presentation, which says, oh, what, what did we encounter issues or what didn't work? And on that, slide, on, on that slide, there is storage, one acceleration, PXE. So uh, uh, seriously, uh, how, could you, how could you live in an enterprise environment without storage, one acceleration, and PXE? And as long as this stuff uh, is not uh, available in a, in a mature uh, state for V6, um, we, we won't see V6 only. And I absolutely agree with that. I wouldn't say that the, the world is ready for this uh, in the next two years, right? And we are very painfully aware of it, and we hope that we are, as corporate IT, we are pushing the envelope for the vendors to deliver those features. But I'm just saying, guys, think about it. It's coming if you want or you're not. Maybe 10 years from now, maybe we'll have a completely different discussion, but still, right? Uh, there are enterprises like us, like Facebooks, Googles, etc., who have to go that route because RFC 1918 is useless. It doesn't solve our problem. It actually hinders our businesses. So, Eric. over to Eric. Yeah, so my neighbor, so you know, okay, I'm working for Cisco, right? So, easy pick. So, but the point, I, I think we are honest there. We cannot move a complete in the IT. I'm pretty sure that the Facebook and the Microsoft and the others still have some IPv4 addresses in some place of the network, right? So. When we say the main IPv6 only, that's for the desktop, that's for the Wi-Fi. That's where the, most of the problems are. So I have no problem to see IPv6 only at 90% of my network in two, three years or earlier, and then going IPv6 only, maybe, right? That net is still there, right? So I'm pretty sure. <laughs> hey, so, so in our case, um, we are IPv6 only, and um, I'll go through the talk later. There are some stuff that is not IPv6 capable. For example, we have the... Z ZTP, right? Zero touch provisioning? Uh, we, had, we, we can do it over V6 as yeah. well. Right? You wrote it though, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the difference. We hack it. Most of the enterprises aren't going to write their stuff. So um, 
But for example, I don't know, we have the refrigeration system of the data centers, right, that we manage, right? Those, those things are not V6 capable. Or the fans that control the humidity of the intake of the DC, right, that we control, those are not V6 capable. So we still need to have some V4, right? Then what we did, and I can go further later, uh, in order to force uh, the actual developers to, to actually write their stuff, one, one small little thing that caused a lot of rage was re very fun to see. Uh, now on Facebook you can do reactions, so a lot of angry reactions, uh, because we don't use email, right? So everything is on Facebook. So um, <laughs> we, we basically remove IPv4 for all the development servers, right? Yeah. So people had to code their stuff that works on v6, and suddenly yeah, half of the things weren't working. But, you know. Um, I, I think your culture is unique in terms of, of, of tolerance of engineering excellence versus maybe uh, operational procedurals of this must be running. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and I, we can go further later, but our approach is not like we, def we don't need an executive support for that. Uh, on our case, it's more like a bunch of engineers that get together and they make stuff happen. Like, like and, I said, unique. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, I mean, of course, you, having some management support sometimes helps. Right. And, uh, but, um, but this is not the, how the decision-making process works at Facebook. We have two gentlemen up top. <laughs> well, I would allow one ahead. more because we are 20 minutes right. into our lunch break. So. All right. Well, we will have still plenty of time. <laughs> Thank you so much for giving me a choice to, to, to ask a question. Uh, there was a, a draft uh, of the new uh, IPv4 and IPv6 standard, uh, extension uh, being published in August, which named is uh, IPv10, which gives you possibility to uh, send packets from IPv4 network to IPv6 network directly without any conversion protocols and all the stuff. What do you think? Does it make sense to to fix, hot fix this kind of problems uh, this year. So my quick answer on that, so I've, I have had some discussions, uh, myself and Tom Coffeen and Scott Hogue, actually we're all talking about this uh, when we were all, all together. I actually, um, so we had a hard enough time getting uh, updated versions of RFC 3484 to 6724 from 6106 to 8106. Uh, just getting a network protocol inside major operating systems is hard enough as it is. I don't believe you're going to see the next generation for IP10 making it into major operating systems, nor being backported. So I think the effort, while laudable, is uh, functionally um, useless. OK, and on that bombshell, I think we need to, um, as Jeremy Clarkson might say, um, I think we need to break for lunch. So thank you again to Ed for a, we, he eventually teased out some discussion.